Okay, welcome everyone. Um, today we are uh, very delighted to have uh, Professor Kobe Nissim, who's uh, McDevitt Chair of the Department of Computer Science in Georgetown University. And he's also affiliated with the Georgetown Law School. Uh, Kobe's work uh, has focused on the mathematical foundations uh, uh, of privacy. In particular, uh, with uh, various co-authors, he initiated this very influential work on differential privacy, which we all know about now. And he has won many, many awards, I guess. Uh, it's a long list, but let me just mention the Godel Prize in 2017, uh, which is one of the biggest prizes in theoretical computer science. So uh, without further ado, uh, Kobe, thank you so much. And the floor is all yours. Okay, um, thank you, Nishit. And thanks for inviting me here. Uh, can you hear me well? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so I'm really delighted to be again at Yale. I hope next time it will be in person um, as were in previous times. Today I'm going to talk about legal theorems of privacy. And this is based on uh, some recent joint work with uh, Michael Altman, Aloni Cohen and Alex Wood. And okay, so let me get into this. So, um, as we observe, uh, increasingly more decisions of legal nature are made in computer science systems. And these uh, traditionally, this included, like in the US, uh, the computation of a credit score. But uh, more recently, we are seeing systems assisting legal decision making, for instance, uh, predicting a risk of recidivism or failure to appear in court, helping judges make uh, bail decisions. Uh, in other countries, we see things like the social score and more, uh, and beyond that, we are kind of swamped with uh, behavioral advertising, personalized recommendations, psychological profiling. This has become part of our day-to-day uh, -day, uh, lives. And in these systems, we also begin to observe that there is discrimination and issues of fairness, whether they were uh, uh, um, uh, maliciously integrated in, in systems or just appear inadvertently. We see privacy risks, we see risks of manipulation and, and many new risks. Now, uh, if we look inside into uh, computer systems, we see like a lot of uh, detailed operations uh, where information is collected, stored, processed, and shared. And oftentimes this is uh, personal information, sensitive information about us. And these uh, operations are supposed to be regulated and we have uh, some new legal standards like the GDPR in Europe, and we have some new um, legal uh, standards in uh, legal privacy standards in California. Um, but we also have to remember that the number of decisions that are made in these systems is really huge. I don't really know what the number is, probably millions or billions of decisions happening every day on small uh, 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 operations like which information to collect, how to store it, where to store it, and so on. And these are also opaque to users, but not only to users, but also to experts and policymakers. And it's very hard to tell whether uh, all these decisions that are made are actually in line with the legal uh, expectations, the legal requirements. and. The problem is that even with this huge number of decisions, even if only a small fraction of them would require deliberation, that would exceed the capacity of our human judiciary systems. Okay. So just think about that. So can we ensure that decisions that are made in computer systems agree with legal requirements? And this is the question I want to address now to begin to address with this line uh, of uh, work. 
Now, in order to answer this, we need to have some uh, uh, joint language uh, that that can help communicate between uh, computer si uh, science and law. And this is what I want to talk about today. But just to make this a little more concrete, the context for this talk is data privacy. The problem itself is much wider than uh, on directly talking about data privacy. And as a caricature for, uh, for this setting, let us think about uh, uh, this simple picture here where uh, personal data is collected. This is information about us collected through uh, whatever computers or, or phones or other uh, electronic machinery that, that we hold and, and, and use. This information is fed into computations. For instance, uh, computations performing statistical analysis or machine learning analysis. And some outcome is uh, uh, we get some outcome from uh, this computation. And hopefully, this outcome is useful for a variety of, uh, of uh, uses like scientific findings, from scientific findings to national security. And the big question here is whether we can compute and release functions of uh, these data sets that contain sensitive personal information and at the same time protect the individual, uh, the privacy of individuals. And of course, in order to answer this question, in to order to address this question, we need to think and understand what this means. What do we mean by uh, protecting individual privacy? Now, uh, if you look at the literature, there are several literatures addressing questions of what privacy is. And I'm going to, in this talk only focus on two uh, kinds of sources. One is computer science and the other are, is in the law. So in computer science or in technical areas, uh, we see uh, privacy being dealt with as a technical concept. And the technical concept, some of the technical concepts that we see are anonymity and differential privacy. And don't worry if you don't know yet what anonymity and differential privacy uh, are. It's not, one is not going to be crucial for this presentation. And two, I'm going to present them shortly in a few slides. So, but when we look into these concepts, they are, Sorry about this. They are described using mathematical language, okay? Either by a description of requirements from algorithms or in other ways, when you look at differential privacy as a definition, you see reference to probability, to, the perform to how algorithms behave and so on. And furthermore, they attempt to offer general privacy protection. These two concepts are used in different contexts, but uh, the concepts are the same uh, concepts, uh, regardless of the con context where they are used. And they seek to provide uh, some guarantee, provable uh, privacy guarantees, mathematically provable privacy guarantees. Okay, so that when we use, um, uh, mechanisms that satisfy a, a, a requirement like differential privacy, we know uh, that some uh, properties will hold. Okay, so we, we have some guarantees that are proved mathematically, like the way you proved mathematical theorems about uh, geometric objects in, in high school. On the other hand, if we look at legal uh, privacy concepts, uh, and I'm going to focus on uh, concepts that appear in legal uh, standards. This is just a small collection of such standards from the US, FERPA uh, is a standard that deals with educational records and HIPAA with, uh, uh, has a, a part that deals with the privacy of um, medical records. And in Europe, the GDPR, and as I mentioned, we have some new uh, 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 regulations like, like the ones that appeared recently in California. And if you look into these regulations, you see that they refer to a collection of concepts. This is just a subset of these uh, concepts. 
Uh, many of them turn on uh, what is called PII, uh, personal identifiable information. So if data contains PII, then there are certain requirements with respect to or, or protections that are needed for this data. And uh, terms that are used include anonymization or the identification, linkability, uh, singling out, inference risk, opt out, consent, and roughly a collection of 15 to 20 uh, concepts like that that serve as the basic building blocks of uh, these legal uh, standards. And now these legal standards are supposed to describe our societal privacy, privacy expectations. And they are not formal from a mathematical standpoint. And if you look at them, there are a lot of gray areas there and uh, ambiguities. Um, and this is definitely a problem when we want to ask whether uh, systems, computer systems, which are crisp, which are well-defined, uh, satisfy uh, these notions. Uh, many of the uh, privacy regulations are sector-based. We're seeing a shift in this, beginning with the GDPR, which is more general, and um, hopefully this will continue. But in the US, a lot of the uh, uh, legal uh, privacy uh, standards are still sector-based. And sometimes, as we progress with uh, the science of privacy, uh, we find out that the legal uh, requirements are in disagreement with uh, the up-to-date scientific knowledge. So what they expect is not in agreement with what we know now mathematically uh, must happen. Okay, so Pete, trying to put these two pieces of the puzzle together, uh, here I'm trying to do it. Um, it's, it's somewhat problematic. And it seems that we need to uh, develop maybe a third piece of the puzzle that will help us bridge between these legal and technical privacy concepts and will be essential part of a discussion uh, of whether systems uh, uh, satisfy legal, uh, the, the expectations of legal uh, privacy standards. So uh, in this talk, I'm gonna have kind of three parts. They're not equally sized. Uh, I'll begin with uh, a short background and I will introduce two concepts, anonymity and differential privacy and some of the motivation that leads to these concepts. Um, then I'm going to discuss uh, computer science and privacy law. Um, very briefly, I'll go over some of the work done in this direction and then I will try to, uh, with more depth, uh, dive into uh, our work where we formalize a concept from the GDPR. This concept is called singling out and reason about it. And this is where we will try to get our legal theorems of privacy. And then we're going to conclude and hopefully have a good coffee or something like that. So let me uh, begin with an attack on privacy, an attack that uh, motivated uh, the development of a privacy concept. This privacy concept is anonymity. So um, in the year 2000, Latanya Sweeney um, took uh, a database uh, which was anonymized and contains medical information of patients in Massachusetts Okay, this data set contained uh, information about, about uh, 135,000 patients. There are many attributes. Uh, 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 so they, they collect uh, information about uh, visits to clinics and hospitals, and there are many attributes per encountered. And uh, this data was anonymized in order to protect those patients whose data was used. So what Latena did, she uh, took a, another data set that is public records. This was the voter registration of Cambridge, Massachusetts. And this is a data set that is open for inspection by anyone. 
Now let's look at the content of these two data sets. A record in the GIC uh, <coughs> uh, uh, data set contained information like ethnicity, visit date, diagnosis, procedures, and so on. Uh, zip, birth date, and sex, but as you see, no name, no address, no social security number. Uh, a record in the voter registration, on the other hand, uh, that was identified, so it was not, it is not uh, is expected to, to that the information there is, is not considered sensitive or secret. Uh, so it's identified, there is a name, address, and so on including zip code, birth date, and sex. And joining these two data sets, and when the join was unique, she could actually re-identify uh, a record that was supposedly de-identified in the, in the GIC data set. In particular, she could find uh, the record, uh, records uh, pertaining to the, uh, who was then the, um, uh, governor of Massachusetts. So this modified uh, and the development of a notion that is called canonymity. And the uh, canonymity uh, is achieved via suppression in order to make every combination of potentially identifying attributes appear at least k times in the data set. Let me give an example. So suppose this is a part of a medical data set. Okay, so here we have six patients. Uh, as you see, we remove their identities, their, their uh, uh, direct identities, uh, but we still have uh, data that is potentially identifying like the zip code, age, and sex. That was the data that uh, Latanya Sweeney used in her attack. And then we have the diseases for these people. So a canonymized data set is going to suppress information from this potentially identifying information in order to make sure that every person is, uh, appears at least in this case twice in the data set, any potential person. For instance, uh, uh, here we had a female age 55 from this zip code 23456 and a male who is 42 from the same zip code, here information was suppressed. So uh, presumably you don't know who was this uh, patient and who was the other patient, okay? Of course, you also permute the, the, the rows in the data set. So you don't need to keep them in the same order as I did here. Okay, so these two, um, patients here now, uh, maybe you cannot identify uh, them because they look uh, the same from the uh, point of view of the potential identifying information. So you don't know if you have, if your neighbor is 55, she's a female and, uh, and she lives with you in the zip code 23456, you don't know whether she had a heart disease or a viral disease, okay? So we don't have this unique identification anymore. But note that in some cases that does not help. Like if two people have the same disease, it still is revealing the sensitive information. And this is called a homogeneity attack. And people tried to uh, change canonymity in order to deal with this. And also another collection of uh, attacks. So uh, over the in the years we've seen variants of canonymity like L diversity and so on that uh, try to address various um, uh, weaknesses in uh, canonymity. But it's a concept that is still in use in many cases. So we spoke about re-identification attack, but the last two decades have revealed some more attacks on privacy. So for instance, composition attacks. What happens when you combine two mechanisms, each of them supposedly privacy preserving, is it the case when you put them together, they are still uh, privacy preserving? And it turns out that uh, with respect to canonymity, this is not the case. You could apply a composition attack uh, to a data that has been canonymized twice. And actually then you would be able to uniquely identify many of the records. 
Uh, we also see data, database reconstruction attacks where the reconstruction uh, manages to um, get right almost the entire underlying data set. And this was applied in practice to the 2010 census data by, by the census. And it was applied by Alondi Cohen and myself to a commercially available system called Diffix. And in both cases, uh, large chunks of the data were uh, reconstructed accurately. And then uh, we also have uh, membership inference attacks where it's possible to determine whether a target individual uh, is in the data set or not. In some cases, this leads to uh, a privacy breach. This was applied to genomic data and also to machine learning as a service. And note also, also that these attacks are um, often attacks on aggregate statistics. So it's not like the, the anonymity considered only the case where the data is kind of uh, maintained in a, in a microdata uh, fashion. So the format of the data is still uh, a collection of records, whereas these attacks can be applied also when they, what is published is statistics like averages, uh, contingency tables, and so on. So this motivates a new concept and differential privacy is uh, answering these uh, issues. Uh, differential privacy is a requirement of a computation. And we say that its computation is differentially private. If any information related risk to a person <coughs> does not change significantly as a result of that person's information being included or not included in the analysis. So in the picture, we can think about it uh, this way. Uh, think about some computation that is performed on data, which is a collection of personal data to produce some outcome. And I may be worried about my privacy because here's my record in the data set. So the computation may leak too much about me in a way that would breach my privacy. So maybe some of my information will appear in the outcome directly or indirectly, or could be inferred from, from the outcome. These are things that I may be worried about. In my ideal world, uh, the same computation would be performed because I'm interested maybe in, in the scientific value of this computation or in its implication for public policy or whatnot. But I would prefer that it would be uh, use the data with my information removed. Okay, in that uh, world, this is my ideal world from a privacy point of view, I get the value from the computation, but I don't have the privacy risk. My data was not included there in the data set. So the computation, there's no way that the computation would uh, reflect anything about it in the outcome. So differential privacy requires that not only for me, but for everybody who's in the data set, this real world and the ideal worlds would be very similar. There is a measure of similarity here, usually um, parameterized by the Greek letter epsilon. I'm not going to get into the full mathematical definition here, but that's the spirit of the definition. And what's nice about it, once we have this mathematical definition, we can actually make uh, theorems and prove them. And in particular, prove resiliency to all these attacks that I mentioned in the previous slide. Okay, so well, this is definitely a crash uh, presentation for, of both concepts. Uh, uh, I'm not expect, expecting you to understand mathematically how they work or anything like that for the rest of the talk, but we will refer to these two concepts in the sequel. So maybe uh, um, this is just a good point to stop and see if there is a, a clarification question or otherwise I will uh, continue. Yeah, if anybody has a question, uh, just please uh, unmute yourself at this point and feel free to ask Kobe. Or if you prefer, you can type it in the chat. Different approaches here. 
I think Michael, Michael I, I don't think we can hear you properly. I hear some very faint noise. Okay, well, let me get closer to the microphone. Does this help? Can you hear me now? It's a little bit better. Yeah. It's yeah. Better. Okay, well, I was just going to say there seem to be two different approaches to privacy. One is to sanitize the database and then throw it out there and anybody can compute anything that they want to on the sanitized data. The other approach, which I think is what the differential privacy slide suggests, is that the constraints are on the computations that are permitted, not on, not on, on, a, on what a sanitized database would be. Is, is that a fair distinction? And, um, so actually there are two orthogonal things. Um, let me go back to, this slide. So the outcome of the computation could be a sanitized database, and there's a lot of work in differential privacy on producing sanitized data sets. Uh, the focus on the computation here, uh, the reason that we focus on the computation and not on the outcome is that the computation is, that, uh, is the process that can create some informational relationship between the input data and the outcome. And without focusing on the computation, we don't understand and hence we cannot analyze that relationship. If we just impose a requirement on the outcome, then we lose information about how that outcome is, is produced. And that information could be crucial for understanding uh, whether that outcome uh, 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 provides privacy or not. Okay, so unless there is another question. Yeah, I think Daniel has a question. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, this is just a follow up on the last question from not from a computer scientist at all, but, but, but I still think the last question's source remains, which is that there are three things you can do to preserve privacy. You can restrict the collection or aggregation of data. You can restrict the techniques that can be brought to bear on that data. For example, by forbidding people from writing or owning certain kinds of algorithms, or even certain kinds of processing power in the way in which, for example, we make it criminal to possess certain kinds of weapons. Or you can restrict the use of the processing techniques on the data to produce certain outcomes. For example, the way in which we make it an additional sanction if I commit a robbery while carrying a gun, right? So you can do all three of these things, but it doesn't seem like you're focusing equally on all three of them, which presumably comes from the computer science perspective. Yeah, so you're absolutely right that our focus as computer scientists is on the computation itself. Right. The, the, the procedure that maps input data into outcomes. Right. Um, I ju just would say that this is uh, like the, the, the other questions, for instance, which data is we should collect on which uh, we should not, for instance, uh, is, is a complex question that, that is to a large extent normative. So not like under what we usually do in computer science, although it does have components that, that we could uh, uh, comment and, and talk about, and similarly about the use of the outcome. So uh, maybe naturally for us, focusing on the computation is, is uh, we focus on the computation. I want to also say that it, it's a choice that makes a lot of sense. Once you release data into the world, if this is the outcome, it's very hard to control how this data is being used. So unless you make sure through watching the, the, the computation that the outcome is an outcome that protects privacy, no matter how it is used, okay, we, we kind of lose control. So uh, there is a reason for focusing on the computation here. But thanks, this is a very good question. Okay, so let me continue. And here I want to uh, switch to talk about this uh, relationship between computer science and privacy law. 
So let me begin with some and just listing some works that are broadly in this direction where we're trying to create, where we or others are trying to create this bridging, this mixing of uh, computer science and legal thinking about the problem. So let me uh, begin uh, with maybe these four, uh, and, and I call it, call, call it them here to separate them. Uh, uh, we did some work on beginning uh, with the FERPA, FERPA uh, privacy standard, trying to model it mathematically. Uh, there's been work on the concept of compelled decryption, trying to uh, begin with this legal concept and shed light on it using uh, tools from uh, mostly cryptography. Uh, there's work on um, uh, formalizing notions of data deletion or the right to be forgotten. And there is this work that I will talk about today on taking where we took a concept from the GDPR, this concept of singling out, tried to formalize it mathematically, and then go back and ask whether this uh, mathematical formalization has legal uh, consequences. Okay. Uh, in some other work, uh, we tried to uh, build, to, to, to do something in the other direction, uh, begin with a concept that appears in the legal, in the, sorry, in the technical literature, literature, this is concept of composition and translate it into language that would hopefully be useful for uh, a, a legal discussion of uh, privacy. Okay, let me also mention uh, a few, other works, one is uh, the, the uh, framework of contextual integrity by Helen Nissenbaum that combines uh, normative and technical concept in one, uh, um, in, in, in one framework. So uh, she reasons about um, uh, norms of information flow between contexts uh, as, as a way to reason about privacy. There's a lot of work uh, on fairness, beginning with this, maybe beginning with this paper, uh, where uh, computer scientists are trying to formalize different notions of fairness in the context of uh, classification. And more broadly, there are many concepts uh, which were developed in cryptography and theoretical computer science that seem to be related uh, to uh, legal concepts, in particular, these ideas of uh, digital signature and zero knowledge proofs are already making uh, some uh, way in, in our day-to-day -day life in, in, in in places where they have the, their use have legal consequences. Okay, and I, what I'm going to focus on is on singling out. So before I begin with this, I'm going to present some legal text. I have to say I'm not a legal scholar. I'm not a lawyer. So uh, in my work, I rely rely a lot on collaboration with. Uh, legal scholars in order to make sure that the legal analysis part of the work is is done right. If I would do it myself, it wouldn't be done right. Uh, but I may be a little um, informal and inaccurate on the uh, presentation of the legal work. So you may catch me with a mistake here or there or, or something that you would find controversial or uh, something that you, you disagree with. I would say this is natural. So let me begin with uh, the GDPR. The GDPR or General Data Protection Regulation um, is a regulation on the protection of natural persons with regard to the processing of personal data and the free movement of such data. And um, it has uh, been uh, uh, in implementation since uh, May 2018. So now it's almost two years. Uh, and uh, three years, uh, and, um, and and it had repealed a, a, the what was uh, in effect before it, which was the Data Protection Directive or DPD uh, from 1995. 
So uh, the GPR begins with this text in Article 1, stating the scope of the regulation. It says this regulation lays down rules relating to the protection of natural persons with regard to the processing of personal data. So if you are processing the personal data, then the rules in this regulation apply to you. So of course we need to understand what personal data is and in an in Article 4, the GPR rights uh, says personal data means any information relating to an identified or identifiable natural person. And then there is this semi opaque statement an identifiable natural person is one who can be identified directly or indirectly. Okay. So this gives us some uh, understanding of what personal data is. And then in another part of the standard in recital 26, there is some more explanation about how we determine whether a natural person is identifiable. And it says to determine whether a natural person is identifiable account should be taken of all the means reasonably likely to be used such as sing singling out to identify the natural person directly or indirectly, okay? So this part says that in order to make this determination to decide whether uh, a person is, a natural person is identifiable, we should see if some means uh, that can be used uh, can uh, actually result in identifying that person. Okay, and that this identification does not have to be direct, it could be also indirect. And by the way, the only means that is explicitly mentioned in Versailles 26 is singling out. So this, this ellipsis here that I have, I, I just skipped some of the text, but it does not uh, include, that text does not include any other means uh, that is uh, uh, specifically mentioned in in the GDPR, okay? So just from these three parts, we can learn <coughs> that if you can single out in, in the data, then the data is identifiable and hence this is personal data, okay? So uh, understanding singling out can be part of our understanding of what personal data is for the purpose of the, uh, the, the GDPR. Now, there's no other article or recital explaining what singling out means. And the most authoritative uh, text on uh, interpreting singling out is text that was uh, written by a body that was set up not by the GDPR, but, the, but the, by the uh, data protection, the, the DPT, uh, this is called the Article 29 Working Party. And, and this party, uh, this working party um, uh, developed a collection of uh, documents that help um, interpret uh, requirements in the DPD. Uh, in, the DPD has a similar recital like the recital that I just uh, cited in the previous slide. Uh, just that singling out does not appear does not appear there explicitly. So this is an addition in the GDPR that whoever wrote uh, that um, uh, recital decided to include uh, specifically uh, singling out as an example of how of a measure that can be taken to identify a person in in, in a data set. Okay, and. Um, in one of their documents, they explain this. They say, as regards indirectly identified or identifiable persons, so they, they try to explain this concept. This category typically relates to the phenomenon of unique combinations, whether small or large in size. A name may itself not be necessary in all cases to identify individual. This may happen when other identifiers are used to single someone out. Okay, so we can learn from this that singling out appears when you have a unique combination of attributes that make a person unique in the data. Okay, 
And furthermore, in another document, the same Article 29 Working Party surveys a collection of um, uh, uh, technologies with respect to three kinds of risks, singling out linkability and inference. And so for our presentation today, we will focus on this part of the table. And you can see that the, like the two families of technologies that, that I presented, Kaonimity, uh, the Article 29 Working Party thought that if you apply Kaonimity, then uh, singling out is not a risk uh, anymore. Uh, if you apply a differential privacy, they, uh, then it's not clear, okay? They don't say yes or no. Okay. And similarly, if we look at the variant of Kaonimity and diversity, also here, they thought that singling out is not a risk anymore. Okay. So um, keep this table in mind. And let's try now to uh, see if we can formalize a concept of singling out. So our starting point for this research was a suggestion for such a formalization in a paper by Francis and Tal appearing in 2018. And they suggested that singling out should be defined as what I will call isolation, okay? You say you single out if there is exactly one person that has these attributes. Just to make this clear, uh, we can think about this Toy database with three records, okay, people who watched movies at different times. And then we could uh, try to isolate in this uh, data set. For instance, there is exactly a row in the data set, one row in the data set that contains the movie, the sting. So this is a way to isolate the third uh, row in the data set. Or there is exactly one row in the data set of a person who watched the movie Mulan be between February 19th and March 10th. You see, this person uh, watched the movie Mulan between uh, on February 29th, which is in this in this range. But uh, the other people who watched Mulan uh, watched it earlier, so out outside this range. And also, uh, this person is the only one that does not satisfy the other two conditions. So each of these uh, um, statements, each of these descriptions isolates in, in this toy data set. So uh, can we live with this, with singling out as the, with isolation as our interpretation for singling out? It seems to be in line with the interpretation of the uh, working party. Okay, so to answer this, let's uh, make up, uh, a, like, a, a let, let's describe how we think about uh, the entire process. So uh, our data set will think about it as, as drawn for some distribution or from, from an, some underlying population. And this subset from the distribution is fed into a mechanism or some computation to form an analysis. And this publishes some data, I'm going to call it Y. Now an adversary sees this published data Y, which is supposed to protect against uh, singling out because uh, we are going to use a mechanism that protects against singling out. And the adversary will try to come up with an isolating description. I'm, I'm going to call this uh, description a predicate. Okay, this is a predicate, a description that we can evaluate on each row of the data set. And on each row, it will either say true or false. If this predicate is true for just one, exactly one row of the data set, then the adversary managed to isolate and hence single out. Okay. So this is the adversary's goal, given the output y, to uh, find this predicate p that matches exactly one row in the underlying data set x. Okay, and this is our attempt, following the work by Francis et al, to say that m is secure against signaling out if no adversary can isolate a row except with tiny probability over whatever probability sources, uh, randomness sources we have in this process. 
So this may sound reasonable, but the problem is that it's impossible to achieve. And the reason is that we can think about uh, a world, this is a photo experiment where the adversary does not even get a access to the outcome of the mechanism. So in this world, the adversary does not get any information about the data set, except that it is drawn for some un underlying distribution. Can this adversary produce a predicate that isolates in the data set? Okay, it may sound impossible, but actually it is possible. And here's an example. For instance, if the data set contains information about 365 uh, people and the, the, the information is their birth date. Okay. Now, if the adversary chooses a description, says, let's say, born on October 23rd, okay, then uh, we expect this predicate to match a fraction of one over 365 of the universe from which the data was selected. Okay. And now a small uh, mathematical uh, computation shows that actually this manages to isolate in the data set with quite high probability, 37%. So definitely not something negligible. So we have uh, the adversary succeeding with high probability to isolate in the data set, even though he did not get any access to the outcome of the mechanism, there's no reason to blame the mechanism for this failure, okay? So in order to, and actually this generalizes, if the data set has uh, N records, then if uh, the adversary picks a description that matches one over N fraction of the universe, then this uh, isolates the data set with probability 37%, okay, which is quite high. Um, and you may be worried uh, that here the adversary used uh, some knowledge about the data set that it was a birth date, but actually we have mathematical tools uh, that, uh, so that the adversary does not need to, um, to know much about the data set, just that it has sufficient uncertainty, it's something that we measure with uh, a, a measure that is called mean entropy. Uh, but it's a very mild uh, restriction. So we get a general adversary that manages to isolate in data sets without having to know uh, anything about uh, the data sets it's, itself, except that it, it comes from a, a, a distribution that has enough entropy. So in order to fix this, we suggested uh, a notion that we call predicate singling out. And we say that the person is uh, singled out, predicate singled out in the data set if uh, they are isolated in the data set. So we do take the isolation part, but we also require that this isolation is uh, done in a way that is unattributable to chance. Let me give a couple of examples. For instance, uh, this description born on December 23rd, we saw that it isolates uh, in the data set with high probability, 37%, okay? If we could, and actually you can show that this is the optimal, that, that that's the mass, maximum that one can do without knowledge, any knowledge about the data. So if uh, an attacker manages to isolate with probability uh, one, 100% of the time, okay, this is something that is not attributable to chance. And this is something that we would call predicate singling out. So if the attacker exceeds that significantly. But even more in, importantly, if we have a description that is so, um, so specific that's not, not even likely that a person like that exists, like this vegan Colombian 27 year old epidemiologist practices capoeira, loves knitting and fluent in Dutch and Japanese. Okay, so this is a description that uh, is very unlikely. And if an attacker manages to isolate with such a description, this is not attributable to chance, okay? These notions can be formalized mathematically, and, but I'm going to skip the mathematical uh, formulation and just give this intuition. But now 
we can define predicate singling out this notion as uh, we say that an anonymization mechanism prevents predicate singling out if the chance that an attacker manages to predict uh, to uh, predicate singling out a person in the data set is not too different depending on whether the attacker knows the output of the mechanism applied to the data set or knows nothing at all about the data, about the data set. So we require that even with access to the output of the mechanism, the attacker has a similar success probability as if they did not see the output of the, of the mechanism. So a few things to say about this. Uh, one, it is realizable. Here's a simple mechanism that is um, a predict, a secure against, uh, against uh, pre predicate signaling out. This is a mechanism that uh, is parametrized on some description. So let's say this is a description that can be either true or false applied to each of the records of the data set. And we're uh, interested in counting how many rows in the data set satisfy this description. Okay, for instance, how many tall people do we have in this data set? Okay, and we can prove the theorem that for every such predicate, this mechanism that counts the number of uh, rows satisfying it is predicate signaling out uh, secure. Okay, let me skip the intuition for the proof. Um, but now, sorry, but now, we have a notion and it's a notion that is realizable. And actually it gives us that like the most basic statistical query on the data set is uh, secure, which is really reassuring and really something that maybe we would want to have uh, to allow in, in, um, in, uh, in, in computations over data. Uh, we, we want to have uh, this kind of utility. But now we have a concept. We can also ask questions about the concept itself. For instance, I mentioned composition attacks earlier on. Is it the case that if we compose uh, two or more mechanisms which are uh, predict secure against uh, predicate signaling out, do we still maintain that security? Okay. And so think about this case where we, uh, each of these mechanism M1 to ML is, let's say is secure against uh, a predicate signaling out. What happens if we consider them as one mechanism? And we can prove this uh, theorem that unfortunately uh, secure, piece of security is not necessarily maintained. We have even an example where two mechanism, each of them is PSO secure when we compose them together, uh, we lose uh, security against predicate signal out. Okay, so this showed a, a sh shows a weakness of this concept, and we believe that because uh, we have some examples which are uh, where these uh, individual mechanisms are quite natural, that actually it reflects uh, a, a, on the notion of uh, uh, signaling out more generally, not only our interpretation, uh, that maybe this notion uh, is, has inherently this weakness that it does not self-compose. Now we're getting to uh, our legal theorems and we want to look at technology, these two technologies, differential privacy and anonymity and ask whether they satisfy our notion of predicate signaling out, okay? So we can prove these two theorems. Again, I'm not going to uh, give uh, the, the, the proofs themselves. We can prove that every differentially private mechanism is secure against uh, predicate signaling out. Uh, and this proof furthermore reveals some connection to properties of differential privacy and, 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 and generalization. And we also can also prove that uh, many natural uh, canonymity mechanisms are not uh, PSO secure, okay? And in this case, we construct an attacker 
that uses the K-anonymous data publication as a step stepping stone towards uh, singling out, predicate singling out. Okay, so we show that actually K-anonymity in many cases helps an attacker to single out. So now we're getting to the legal part. Are there in legal implications of these mathematical theorems? And we believe there are, but we have to be very careful here. So first, there is a caveat. We provide a mathematical model here for a legal concept. And we believe that our modeling may be uh, uh, somewhat too weak for capturing the GDPR notion of signaling out, okay? And the reason is that we're making assumptions that the GDPR may not be hap, you know, uh, happy to restrict attention to only data drawn from a, an underlying distribution. We don't consider auxiliary knowledge and so on. So if uh, protection against uh, predicate signaling out may be too weak for the GDPR. In terms of uh, what this means about our results, it means that the negative results are more legally meaningful than the positive results, okay? And the legal, legal results are more legally uh, meaningful because we're strict, by restricting the scope, we strengthen the negative result. We say even this weaker notion of signaling out is not achieved by anonymity. And hence, we believe that anonymity uh, likely doesn't provide sufficient protection against the GDPR singling out. The positive results have only restricted implication. And this is because it may be that preventing predicate singling out attacks is necessary, but not sufficient for, uh, for the GDPR. And in particular, it may be the GDPR probably uh, expects security against other measures, not only against singling out. So um, whether the use of differential privacy satisfies the GDPR uh, requirement needs further analysis. Going back to this table, we believe that the, the answers to these uh, two questions need to be uh, reconsidered, hopefully in the next uh, uh, a version of uh, this document by the uh, relevant working party under the GDPR. So let me summarize, sorry, I'm going uh, over time about only a uh, couple more minutes. So what, what did we see here? We see some work beginning with a legal concept, translating it into a technical concept, and then going back and asking whether we have uh, the, this tec technical uh, formulation and, and the technical analysis have legal implications, okay? So we began with the GDPR notion of signaling out. We uh, uh, derived a definition of uh, predicate signaling out security. And there's a reason we're not going and calling it signaling out. Uh, we believe that it may be a different concept. Uh, so it's kind of an approximation for the concept of singling out and probably a tad too weak to capture that notion from the GDPR. But once we have this mathematical uh, um, formulation, we can uh, use mathematical tools to analyze it. And in particular, we see that uh, this notion does not self-compose. And we believe that this has implications for the notion of G singling out in the GDPR that probably more broadly, not only our formulation, uh, more broadly, this concept uh, does not compose. Does not mean that it is a bad con concept by itself, but it probably suggests that it is insufficient as a requirement of privacy because composition is an important property that we would want to maintain. Economicity, uh, economization is not PSO secure. And here we believe that there are legal consequences uh, that economization uh, likely doesn't prevent uh, the notion of singling out from the GDPR. Differential privacy is uh, PSO secure, which 
gives some inconclusive evidence that uh, it prevents the notion of singing out from the GDPR and this requires more analysis. And furthermore, uh, in our work, um, something that is not uh, uh, present here, we started working on creating a legal concept that is based on this mathematical formulation of predicate singing out. And in the paper, we provide some legal language trying to capture this concept in a way that hopefully can be integrated in contracts and in uh, regulation. And here I have a few references uh, uh, for various parts of the talk. I'm happy to share the slides if somebody is interested. Uh, so you don't have to copy anything from here, but maybe that's the time to conclude. Uh, thank you, Kobe, for this uh, wonderful lecture. Um, I guess we can take maybe uh, one or two quick uh, questions uh, before we adjourn for today. So if you have a question, uh, just feel free to unmute yourself. Okay, so I'll ask uh, Kobe a question uh, about, so, I mean, going back to your comment that negative results seem more useful as far as, uh, you know, the world of law is concerned. Um, and is there, yeah, so, I mean, how serious is that statement uh, in a sense that is there, I mean, are you very pessimistic or you're somewhat, uh, optimistic that eventually we'll figure out a way to make positive statements which will have implications in the world of law. Yeah. And if so, you know, what kind of, uh, you know, maybe can you, can you imagine some statements uh, already which might be positively useful? No, definitely. So um, uh, I didn't mean to say that all translations from the law result in uh, weak, two weak translations. And in fact, in this work where uh, we uh, analyzed uh, privacy requirements of FERPA, um, uh, we believe that our modeling, our the requirement that in, we derived it actually much stronger than what the, um, what the uh, regulator meant, which means in this case, that if you manage to prove that a, a technology satisfies the requirement, this is a strong, uh, evidence that this requirement satisfies the, uh, the, the legal requirement, that this, uh, sorry, this technology satisfies the, the legal requirement. So we have both kinds of results. In some cases, the model seems a bit too weak. In some cases, the model seems a bit too strong. And I think that this is going to be, uh, at least for a while, a rule in, in, these, in these modelings. Uh, the, the legal standards are not crisp. There, there will always remain some level of uncertainty around them. So maybe the best we could do is try to sandwich them between like an upper bound and lower bound and try to squeeze this upper bound and lower bound as much as we can to uh, leave that area of uncertainty, um, you know, as, as small as possible. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, more questions? Okay, let's thank uh, Kobe for this wonderful talk and thank you all for joining. And uh, yeah, see you all soon. Okay, thank you so much and see you soon. Thank you.